I'm very pleased to be here today. And I want to start out by um, actually thanking Sequelia for the, that prayer and the song and uh, for those kind words. And I was uh, in a court appearance early this morning. And so I was holding my hands together. And, and when she got me to open them and just ground myself, it was uh, such a delight. So thank you. I'm so pleased to be here to speak to um, those who are working in the healthcare system to improve quality. And I particularly want to say thank you both to Devin and Christina, but more generally to the council. Um, certainly in terms of the work that we've been doing to look at anti-Indigenous racism in the healthcare system in British Columbia, the work of the council has been important. Um, I had remarkable participation and support during this review of the council and from many people working in the field on quality and patient safety. And the quality matrix, um, particular by embedding um, cultural safety is quite important for some of the recommendations and pathways that I'll be going forward. I also think it's so important to have forums like this. And I, it's unfortunate it's a virtual and we can't actually get together, but I'm hoping in the future, not too distant future, that will be possible. It's so important that we get together and talk about these things because everyone needs to take responsibility for improving the system. And improving this system of care in British Columbia means improving the experience of patients at the point of care, all patients and particularly Indigenous patients, um, because what we learned in this process of conducting an independent review of BC's healthcare system is that there is significant racism at the point of care in British Columbia's healthcare system and in all regions. And just before I go through the uh, PowerPoint to the next slide, I did want to pause for a moment just to uh, say two things. One is to thank my um, colleague, Harmony Johnson, who is also in our virtual gathering today. And Harmony was the director for the review. I led the review, but um, we worked very closely together and collaboratively with a small team. And I just wanna say thank you to her in particular for her incredible competence and knowledge and skill um, in managing along uh, with you know, myself and this team, a very intense experience reviewing the system and ensuring that the review is done in a culturally safe way. And uh, also, just so grateful for, to the cultural uh, advisors and knowledge keepers who assisted us during this process. Um, if you could just advance to the next slide, please. Uh, I also wanna give an emotional trigger warning just to make a note that um, the topics are difficult and there is support, particularly for indigenous people who may be participating today and listening, this is quite, quite um, triggering and I am going to have to speak very frankly about different kinds of racism that are in the system and that can be very challenging. So please know that there are supports and please bear with me on this because it is important that we have a frank dialogue and a frank discussion about what we found in this report. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the focus, uh, for today's presentation, I'm really going to talk about the quality of the experience at the point of care, as I said, and there's two reports that have been released um, as part of this broader review that was commissioned by Minister Adrian Dix in June 2020. First of all, there was a report issued on November 30th that looked at the findings of uh, a lot of engagement. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And then I, I was able to be delegated under the Health Act and by the minister to have access to data and information along with a few members of my team. We did collect data and there was a data report that we issued on February 4th, which looks more at the issue of outcomes, utilization, patterns and gaps in BC's healthcare system that are connected to the uh, findings in the first report about the existence of racism at the point of care. So these are both there at the end of my presentation, you'll see the website, they're available for you to review, um, circulate, discuss, all of that's publicly available for you to cite and, and use. There are a few other products, if you like, from the review, shorter papers that will be available. There also will be um, a few articles coming out, shorter articles, one in the BC Medical Journal, uh, another one in a nursing publication, 
Um, and so you'll see other um, shorter versions if you do need to work to disseminate this information within uh, your workplaces. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, in terms of what we heard, I know there's a lot of little dots on the screen here, it's hard to see, but um, it, during the review process between June and uh, you know about end of September, we engaged with about 9,000 British Columbians. Um, we conducted surveys, extensive surveys with frontline health workers from all sort of uh, work groups, colleges, professions. And of course, with Indigenous people, primarily First Nations and Métis, um, we, we also received direct complaints. And those direct complaints uh, were called into us or emailed to us. So there were cases that were brought to our attention. In some instances, we had people begin a survey process and then send us a complaint because they felt that their issues were not being adequately uh, addressed. And then we, you can see here the sort of snapshot of the healthcare data that we were also examining. So it was quite a significant broad examination. And this report is a report that is about the evidence of what we found in the system. This is not an advocacy report saying this is what we wanted to find. We didn't want to find this. This is what we did find. And I'm also very grateful we did have um, people like the former provincial health officer, Dr. Perry Kendall and others with us. So when we did design surveys to look at cultural safety, the experience of Indigenous people or healthcare workers in the system, they were designed, we hope to have longitudinal life so they could be run again. We're hoping that that will be continual benchmarking and evaluation of how we're doing with respect to this. Um, Oh, and I just got a reminder to say, I just wanted to remember to tell everybody that I don't have any conflicts. I don't represent any particular um, industry or others with respect to this matter. So this is really just a presentation on the independent report that was prepared. So apologize, I didn't make that comment sooner. Next slide, please. In terms of the terms and, and concepts, so first of all, I want to note that there is a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about these terms and concepts. Um, with respect to the point of care. So at the point of care, uh, and this slide in particular, on the left-hand slide are sort of issues that we found, which are quite poorly understood. In the middle are sort of mindsets and practices and tools that have been promoted and are significant. On the right-hand side are desired outcomes um, or things that we're hoping to achieve or measure or states that we would like to have at the point of care. This is very focused on point of care. Um, and again, all of this, there, if we could put a bubble around this slide, we would call it quality. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, what are the issues? Well, racism. So what is racism? It's a sets of distinctions based on people's skin color, can be background, cultural background. Um, it can be sometimes geographic. It can be a combination of things. The Indigenous specific racism or anti-Indigenous racism that we looked at was looking only at the experiences of First Nations, Métis, Inuit people because they're different than others um, and they needed to be looked at separately. So what I'm going to say in this report and what I did say um, is really about Indigenous people. There's no question there are other experiences that would constitute racism in the healthcare system involving uh, you know, black, people of color, other people's experiences based on religion, etc. So there's discrimination and attitudes that are in the system. We didn't look at that. We had to look very much at the anti-Indigenous uh, racism and how Indigenous peoples were being treated. Um, and we looked at <clears throat> both racism being individual, meaning how a person is being treated at the point of care. That can be directly at a patient or a worker. It can be indirect, which you're observing it happening against someone else. Um, so it can be direct or indirect. It can be intentional or not intentional. And that's quite important because one of the things is when we look at the issue of racism against Indigenous people is to see that, well, we are unpackaging and addressing some level of it in some places. As we peel it back, there's more there. And I'll talk a bit more about what we found about that. So some prejudices may be falling to the wayside, 
but there are still some very pernicious prejudices and racist views that persist and impair the quality of care. There is something called profiling. You see it more in the criminal justice system, namely what is the profile that someone would have a preset profile, for instance, of the indigenous person before they come in for care. We did see that in the healthcare system profiling. Um, then the issue of what is discrimination? Well, it's important to know that discrimination is sort of the encounter at that point of communication. So racism can be based on sort of beliefs and values, but how racism meets the situation of conflict on the ground at the point of care is where discrimination arises. Um, and so that's a very important distinction uh, there. In terms of mindsets and practices, in terms of that middle part of the, the, the screen, what is an anti-racist mindset? What are anti-racism tools and how do they go to care and quality of care? What is cultural humility? In British Columbia, we have commitments with First Nations Health Authority to promote cultural humility and safety. We have some onboarding and high level training like the Sanyas program that is to do that, although it only reaches less than 2% of the health care workforce in BC. Cultural humility is about a state and that state uh, and, and tool of being able to interrogate and understand and fill with knowledge, interrogate is too negative of a word, knowledge and understanding the experience of Indigenous peoples to prepare or ready yourself for an outcome of cultural safety. There's a lot of confusion between cultural safety and cultural humility on the ground. And when we bring in racism, further confusion. So anti-racism is a set of tools that we are going to illuminate through this report. Cultural humility involves a set of tools. What are the outcomes? What is, it, what is the state of quality? If we had to define and enhance quality and appreciate the dimensions of quality as Indigenous people, what would it have? Well, there's a few outcomes we've talked about here, and that's on that sort of right-hand side. The far right-hand side of that slide is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, British Columbia adopted the declaration and is implementing it into all of the laws policies of the province. It was adopted in 2019. I've just exclude, extruded here for you Article 24, which is one article of the declaration, but very important for healthcare, which is the article that says Indigenous people have the right to access without discrimination all social and health services. So access without discrimination. It's very important how it's framed. The second part of Article 24 is about the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health and taking necessary steps to progressively achieve that. So that is actually now the law in British Columbia. We don't have to make it the law, it is the law. It applies to all of our uh, workplaces and all of the healthcare system. In terms of the outcomes that we would like to see when we have this sort of like very strong imperative to address discrimination, racism and so forth, in terms of the issue of substantive equality. Indigenous people may not have the same starting point as other British Columbians, but we want substantially the same outcomes. That's important to understand that at the point of care. You may be engaging at the point of care with a patient, a First Nations patient that has got significant disease burden compared to someone else in the same sort of age, cohort, gender, etc. So substantive equality is going to require thinking about how we can address those gaps and address it, but also system thinking about it. Cultural safety is a state where there can be, and I'm not going to say neutral in terms of purely objective, but a positive support and blanketing of the Indigenous patient so that they are safe to communicate with understanding. Um, then in terms of the Indigenous human rights, I've just given you this Article 24. It's one of many, but there's a reason why Indigenous people's rights have to be reinforced and restated in British Columbia because they have not been recognized. So part of our transition is this transition. Uh, now, you're gonna see throughout the presentation, there's a few quotes, and in the report, there are many cases. We took emblematic cases and put them forward. We had hundreds on hundreds of cases, so we couldn't possibly um, put everything in the report, but we did use emblematic cases to show what were the majority of the actual uh, circumstances that Indigenous people brought forward to us during the review. Next slide, please. 
So what do we hear from our engagement, our extensive surveying and so forth? Well, 84% of the Indigenous respondents reported some form of discrimination in healthcare. 35% of the respondents had witnessed interpersonal racism or discrimination directed toward Indigenous patients or their friends and families accompanying them at the point of care. And for Indigenous respondents only, namely, did you witness it? It was almost 60%. Um, this is an interesting point. Indigenous healthcare workers, more than half, reported experience direct personal racism. And 42% of the non-Indigenous respondents reported witnessing racial, racial prejudice toward healthcare workers. So it's in the workforce, it's in the work environment, it's in the collegial environment. The top reported reasons why racism exists, employees are not willing to speak up, lack of accountability by leadership to stop this behavior and this insufficient number of healthcare professionals. Now the next slide, um, please. And the next slide is an infographic. I know it's gonna be really hard for you to see this, but this um, PowerPoint will be available for you to print out and look at. This is a high level um, description of how we see uh, racism impacting the care system. So when you look at this slide, you will see that you come into the healthcare system as an Indigenous person through this gateway of colonialism. And that's because the impact of having a segregated healthcare system, which was set up by the laws and policies of Canada and through processes like the Indian Act and so forth, that you have this foundation of coming into uh, sort of Western healthcare, which is segregated. And then as you come into this wheel, if you like, the first, um, stop you have there at the sort of two o'clock state is called stereotypes. So this is a list, and again, I appreciate you probably can't see it very well on the screen. This is a list of the main sort of stereotypes, prejudices that are operating in the care system at the point of care. So that's on the part of workers uh, and uh, those who may be in a hospital setting and any clinical setting. This does go out beyond the hospital setting to the GP, NP, dental, the whole system. So here are the top sort of seven things we found that indigenous people, have, it was primarily directed at First Nations, although it was broader, but primarily First Nations in terms of the intensity. Uh, less worthy, drinkers and alcoholics, drug seeking, bad parents and a lot of issues about the parenting or bad grandparents, a uh, lot of family information that has come in through the child welfare system and sort of follows the patient. Uh, frequent flyers, that was a term that um, we saw a lot of this idea of what's a frequent flyer, person flying in and out, um, and so therefore being treated as somehow less worthy. Uh, Non-compliant with health uh, requirements, <clears throat> less capable, get stuff for free, and then a whole range of misogynistic views of women, um, like that women are sexually available, have too many children, have too many partners, have a different pain threshold, um, a whole set of stereotypes and gender discrimination that uh, was layered on top of um, the race discrimination. The stereotypes lead to what you see at like four o'clock in the wheel called discrimination. So it's really important to have a look at what are the beliefs, the racial prejudices and stereotypes and beliefs that are there, which is why we've sort of taken this assessment, then to talk about how do they impact quality and care? That's where you come into what that category called discrimination. We call it discrimination because we are of the view that it is discriminatory, but what does discrimination look like? Like what specifically would you look for if you look for it? Well, it looks like the following. One, abusive interactions. That's physically abusive, so rough treatment and verbal abuse. A lot of verbal exchanges, which I will call verbal abuse because they're based on prejudice, so it goes into the world of abuse. <coughs> Denial of service, ignoring and shunning, inappropriate pain management or no pain management, uh, medical mistakes and disdain for cultural practices. So this side of the wheel kind of like gives you a picture of what we found. Then the impact of this treatment this that's come into the care system and how it affects Indigenous people, you then see it at sort of seven o'clock on that screen where it says less access. And what does that look like? That looks like unwelcoming environments, lower GP and NP attachment, uh, geographic barriers, mistrust and avoidance of care, 
And that is related to the racism. And then that in turn comes up to impact or outcome. So what's important about this graphic is it is like the one page summary of the findings, which is what we're finding at the point of care, how the interactions are compromising the quality of that care and the safety of the care, and then how that in turn affects the cycle. So when you get on safe care, you've been inappropriately treated, you've had an abusive interaction, you get to avoidance. You get to avoidance, you then get to poor health outcomes. So these are quite significant interrelations. And as you can see at the top in the green, it says like, break the cycle. So you can't just break the cycle by saying, we're gonna work on better outcomes. You have to address the stereotypes and the discrimination to be able to work on the better outcomes. Next slide, please. So the findings, um, these are just 11 findings. Um, there's widespread racism and stereotyping. Racism limits access to medical treatment and negatively affects the health and wellness of Indigenous people in BC. Um, Indigenous women and girls are seriously disproportionately impacted and public health emergencies are magnifying racism. And that's both the COVID uh, pandemic, the disproportionate impact on Indigenous people, higher diagnoses, there's already a significant disease burden, very significant risk as we're grappling with that, as well as the opioid overdose epidemic. Um, so Indigenous healthcare workers and students face racism and discrimination in their work and study environments. And then we looked at the so-called existing solutions. And again, this is important for this group because is there a sufficient understanding of this to address quality within the current system? And we are of the view that the system has to be improved. Current education training not adequate, complaints processes are not working for Indigenous people, Indigenous health practices and knowledge is not being integrated, insufficient hardwiring of the uh, cultural safety into the system, the tools are not clear, as I said earlier, the definitions and understandings of what's the difference between prejudice, discrimination, and access, these are not well understood. And of course, limited accountability or no accountability for eliminating the racism in the system. Next slide, please. Now, the second report we put out in February was the data report. I just wanna share with you some high level observations about healthcare utilization trends that layer on top of this racism and help us to understand the challenge ahead to improve quality and do system improvement. So indigenous people in British Columbia are receiving healthcare in a way that's skewed from primary to secondary tertiary care. So this drives certain things like lower cancer screening rates for treatable cancers. I just put up on the slide the example of um, the example in particular of cancer screening amongst First Nations women for cervical cancer. It's lower, yet the disease burden is quite a bit higher. So it's a really good understanding. The um, emergency department is the locus of care with the adult user rates two times or more greater than other residents. Um, and we look at in the data review, we take this apart and look at all these differences. A lot of the abusive interactions are happening in that environment because in part what's going on in that environment is become a substitute for preventative care, but also the health crisis that comes in the door. Um, Indigenous women are shouldering the greatest burden. And well, you know, certainly I came into this review with not a lot of pre-set assumptions, but the briefing that I received coming in was this is a rural remote problem and it's that's the problem. And when we did the review and looked at it, we found that it's not a rural remote problem, but in fact, it is a problem everywhere in British Columbia. And just the last bullet point on this slide, Indigenous women in particular are quite disproportionately affected. And even in our best, you know, teaching high quality specialty hospital like Women's Hospital, we have Indigenous women leaving at 11 times, leaving against medical advice at 11 times uh, greater rate than other residents, which suggests to me that, you know, it is significant that we do work embedded across the system. Next slide. So in terms of recommendations, there's 24 recommendations on systems, behaviors, and beliefs. Uh, to tr and the system ones are really important for the uh, patient safety and quality council and those that are working in quality. System improvement. 
Um, issues like a standard for cultural safety and humility with good anti-racist tools that's operationalized, measured and reported on very significant. Defining the quality of care to mean care being delivered in an anti-racist way. Addressing a speak up culture, applying the Public Interest Disclosure Act. So there's quite meaty recommendations. Sorry if you're a vegan, there's quite, <laughs> there's quite hearty recommendations in the report. Um, and one of the recommendations was that the Ministry of Health form a task team to take the recommendations like anything. When you make recommendations as an independent reviewer, you're not like inside the system. So you can't exactly precisely tell people it's not appropriate, but you identify the area, you identify what needs to be worked on and you rely on the system to engage and do the work. Um, and so that is the stage we're in now is the system is engaging. They have a new senior associate deputy, Indigenous Health, Indigenous person named Don Thomas. And there's need to not just have one person, but a, a number of system changes. Next slide, please. And kind of my final set of views are, let's talk for a minute about quality. Let's reflect on quality for a second. Um, we need to embed cultural safety in this definition of quality. I've said, I mentioned the speak up culture. Experience at the point of care is our primary focus. I believe it's all of your primary focus, which is why I know this has to be discussed with this group. We need accreditation, we need health regulation, but we also need immediate steps because the incidents don't stop. And now that the racism report is public and is being discussed and acknowledged, more complaints are gonna come forward, more instances are gonna become public and challenged, which is important because change is needed. And of course, I would highlight the final point, which is better care is urgently required for indigenous women. Um, final slide just gives you a place to go to get further information. Um, if you could just advance, yeah. So, and we still ha are running this toll-free line for complaints. Um, we did migrate it to the ombudsman, but we will continue to align that for, for a period of time. Um, and I think that is the end of my time, but I just want to say thank you today for uh, allowing me to present. And I'm going to just ask my colleague, Harmony Johnson, if she wants to say anything as well. Marilyn, thank you very much. And having been um, having heard it, I think this is close to my third or fourth and pieces of it. Um, your first slide about it being um, uh, causing trigger and a trigger warning is truth is truth. And um, so thank you. And again, in hearing the things and everything you have to say about it, I really appreciate you starting uh, the quality forum this year as well. We do have an opportunity for questions. So please do enter into the chat any questions you may have uh, for Mary Ellen and uh, Christina and I will facilitate those to the best of our ability over the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, we um, will be able to uh, have some of those and answer as many as we can as we go through it. Uh, but I think for the first bit, if we're okay, will we get organized? Maybe Christina, if I can hand it over to you to ask, uh, ask your first question. Yeah, great. And thank you, Mary Ellen. It's um, always great to see you. And we're just really thrilled that you're able to join us today. Um, one of the things that um, I think I've been curious about, and I know some colleagues of mine too, is just your reflections on the experience that you've had leading this review. What did it mean for you to be involved in the leadership and being able to take on this work? Uh, well, thank you so much for that question, Christina. Well, first of all, it was a great um, privilege to do this work and to do it with good people. And I can also say that we, the team that we had, had like no barriers to get information from across British Columbia's healthcare system, across all professions, health employees, union, um, the, the council and others, uh, docs of BC, and of course, First Nations and Métis communities and organizations. So one of the things that was quite important to me was the fact that we had such a unity of purpose to finally kind of look at it and address it. And I didn't know what we were going to find, but I thought that it was quite a unifying experience. However, I feel a bit like looking at racism was kind of like turning on a fire hose. And it, while it was there, when it came out, people were in shock. Not Indigenous people, but non-Indigenous people. And while we initially were investigating like a couple incidents, pretty soon it became quite large. At the same time, I think the cultural advisors and support that we had and the elders and others who really provided guidance through different um, places like the regional entities within the First Nations Health Council, 
they were very strong to say, do not take down a path of shaming and blaming. Like accountability has to be there, but we have to move forward to solutions. So that was a very big piece. I was really grateful for that. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's always an honor to work on something. This is not a small thing, but I also see it as being very, I don't want to say fixable, like easy fix, but I just feel like we have fantastic people in the system who want change and where they're stymied from doing the change is, you know, this why this forum with those who are working in quality, this is a key place where the change has to happen. Because for the first time people would say, well, what is the definition of quality? Like, what does it actually mean? And I'm like, oh, isn't that great? Let's talk about it. Let's enhance it. Let's strengthen it. So those are the sorts of areas. And that was people in the healthcare system, right? And oh, so the quality does really matter. Patient experience does really matter. And maybe we don't get the full story. So these are huge positives from my respectful view. So I have nothing but like feeling honored and privileged to have done this. But I also think like, why are we not connecting the dots between the people that have the leadership, the competency and the partnerships, the culturally safe partnerships to do this work? So you know, I want those barriers to be removed. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you. I, I um, your comment about the leadership is my view within health is that we and within healthcare now actually have an opportunity for leadership from a societal standpoint now that this has come forward and that came forward from you um, before as well. So I think it is a huge opportunity for us. Um, we do have a question. So Jennifer asked and mentioned that um, during the um, the survey or garnering information that 13% of respondents actually made racist statements. Uh, in the survey itself. Do you mind speaking a little bit about that? Yeah, so what happened was, it was this really interesting situation where people would describe observing a race incident against an Indigenous person, yet at the same time would repeat a racist or prejudiced view. So they'd say, you know, we observe someone who was treated like, you know, they said, you're the town drunk you know, like, what are you doing here? Like a quite racist, offensive thing, they describe it. But then they'd say, but indigenous people do drink too much. So therefore, so you can see they identified the abusive interaction, but they were repeating a prejudice. Now the prejudice may be one where they wouldn't say that to a patient, but they're still having a mindset that indigenous people are drug seeking, drunk, less worthy. So that was a problem. Now. Is it a good that they said it? Yes, it's good because we have to get it out, right? So I tried not to be like super judgmental about that. I actually like was grateful because really we do have to take apart these prejudices. And even in release of the report, like we get, you know, hundreds of emails about like, stop helping the indigenous people. They get everything for free. I'm like, uh, I just did a report on how that's actually a racist thing. But they're like, no, but it's true. And I'm like, well, no, it's not true. So you can see how, yes, there's broader social factors, but you can see why we really have to break them down item by item. So when we use words like racism, people don't know what it means, including people in healthcare. And when you start to unpackage it for indigenous people, and it didn't even matter if the person filling out the health survey was themselves a person of color, non-Indigenous. They also had the prejudices about Indigenous people. So it really shows there's lots of room for work here. And the discussion has to be frank like it is today. I appreciate it can be very triggering. But we need to have that at the point of care, right? Mm -hmm. So I really want to promote an approach to clinical change Mm -hmm. and quality so your topics are <laughs> my topics so thank you <laughs> and thank you and we do know that um you do have to go so we cannot thank you enough for your time this morning and for for being part of and leading the review and bringing it to us this morning as well and also um being able to juggle multiple things virtually as it seems to have access wherever you are so again thank you very much christina if you had any comments yeah, no, Mary Ellen, I just, I want, I want to thank you for your work. And I think for the way that you've challenged us in the system. And I think we have just such a huge opportunity. Uh, we just need to get going. Um, and so you've really given us, a, a, I think, a great path forward. So grateful to you for that.